Welcome to the EADV podcast, the official podcast of the European Academy of Dermatology and Venereology. This episode marks the third in a special series covering some of the best venereology talks delivered at the EADV Congress in Berlin. Across the coming months, you will hear from five world-renowned expert speakers and interviewers covering various venereological conditions. Today we are joined by Dr. Esther Freeman. She's the Director of Global Health Dermatology at Massachusetts General Hospital and Associate Professor of Dermatology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Freeman is a physician scientist performing epidemiological research in the area of HIV dermatology and global health. She's also Chair of Clinical Guidelines at the AAD and member of their COVID-19 task force. But first... Registrations for the EADV Symposium are officially open. Join us in St. Julian's on the island of Malta from the 16th to the 18th of May. You will network with leaders in the field in an intimate setting and dive into the latest research in melanoma, hair and nails, breaking news, climate change and migration, surgical procedures and much more. Go to eadv.org forward slash symposium and register before the 28th of February for an early bird ticket. Dr. Freeman discusses the changing dynamics of monkeypox. The 2022 outbreak, now with 90,000 global cases, challenges its previous understandings with direct human-to-human spread. She covers the controversial reclassification of MPOX as an STI and shares insights from her research, emphasising the need for continued vigilance among dermatologists. Enjoy the episode. Welcome. We are going to talk about the MPOX virus. How many cases are we talking today? Well, over the past most recent outbreak, which has started in 2022, um, we're now at about 90,000 cases worldwide. I think what's particularly interesting about this is that 98% of those cases are in countries that had really never seen MPOX, other previously known as monkeypox, before. Uh, which countries are we talking about? Um, so, to be honest, m- most of the countries of the world, um, where we have previously seen MPOX. Um, to be endemic um, was, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa. We've seen outbreaks previously um, in places like Nigeria and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, But there had only been very rare sporadic outbreaks in places like, for example, Europe or North America that had mostly been imported, which means they've been brought in um, after travel, for example. So this 2022 outbreak was very different because we had human-to-human spread in a lot of countries where the virus is not normally endemic. So there's only one question, why? Yeah, I think, um, you know, once the virus seeds into what we would consider a high-risk population, um, it can spread uh, very quickly. So I think, if anything, the question is actually why hadn't it happened before? Um, The main driver we saw in this outbreak was really direct contact. So human-to-human spread through direct skin-to-skin contact. But you you just said uh, this outbreak started in 2022? in the late uh, COVID area and direct contact. Can you explain that? Yeah, good question. Um, So late 2022, we were kind of just emerging, I think, from our COVID hibernation. Um, And, you know, I'll put it mildly, people are still having sex. (laughs) So um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So there there is still a lot of um, direct human to human contact. And also, um, and I will say by that period where it really broke out in May of 2022, there really weren't any countries that were on lockdown anymore. That brings me to, to the same question. Like, what about the reclassification of MPOX? It's not monkeypox any longer, MPOX. Why is it considered to be as an STI again? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's actually somewhat controversial. Um, it turns out that what defines a sexually transmitted infection is not really black and white or clear cut. Um, And so recently, for example, the Infectious Disease Society of America did go through their criteria of what defines an STI um, and felt that it did meet the criteria. But I will say not everyone you talk to will agree. So you have been done research. What are the main clinical research? Yeah. So I am the principal investigator of the Uh, International League of Dermatologic Societies and the American Academy of Dermatology COVID-19 MPOX and Emerging Infections Registry. That's a really long name. It is. Um, (laughs) But what that basically means is that it's a registry internationally where we collect cases. We started with COVID-19, really trying to understand the skin manifestations of COVID-19. And then when MPOX hit, we realized we already had a tool that was well known to dermatologists around the world that we could then expand. And so what we do is collect clinical cases of MPOX 
Um, and so very rapidly, it allows you to be sitting wherever you are as a dermatologist in whatever country and share the different clinical cases with us. And so the main goal was to characterize what dermatologists were seeing in these cases, because we knew that the 2022 outbreak is different than other outbreaks we've seen before. What 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 was different regarding uh, the skin? Yeah, so I think one thing that's interesting is from the textbooks, what we thought we knew about MPOX was the way MPOX is supposed to behave, if you read the textbooks, is that you would get a fever or what we call a prodrome before the skin lesions and that the skin lesions would happen afterward and that there might be a lot of them. In the reality, what we were seeing in the 2022 outbreak um, is that the very first thing could be a skin lesion. You don't necessarily have to have a fever or be otherwise ill. You could literally have one skin lesion. So um, patients were coming in where they literally just had one skin spot. Perhaps uh, were in doubt uh, if they should visit uh, the doctor. Absolutely. And as dermatologists, if you just saw one, you know, MPOX or previously known as monkeypox wouldn't necessarily be high on your differential. So understanding that the visual presentation might be very different was important to us. And I think the other piece that we saw in textbooks is that the lesions are supposed to go through, and I say supposed to if you read the books from prior outbreaks, um, this progression where they start as a macular papule, they move on to become a pustule, they become a vesicle, and then they kind of erode and then they heal. And instead, what we're seeing is that this kind of lots of different lesions can happen at the same time. They might come in and they might even just start with an ulcer. They don't necessarily go through the textbook progression. So we just want people to be aware that it can look very different. Did you find out why? Why isn't isn't uh, the outbreak this time behaving like it, like it should be in the textbook? I think there are several possible reasons. Um, one is that um, MPOX is not all exactly the same. And so this is a, called a clade 2B virus. Previous outbreaks were either clade 1 or clade 2A. So it's possible that the virus itself is behaving differently. I think another possibility um, is the fact that if you think about prior outbreaks and who was characterized, they were the really the sickest of patients who ended up getting diagnosed. For example, if you were in Nigeria, if you had one skin spot, you wouldn't necessarily have been diagnosed with MPOX. So do we truly know what the full spectrum of disease was before? I would argue that we don't. And then I think the third piece that comes up is, you know, we we can't ignore the fact that we were just coming out of COVID-19. And so does the fact that all of us had been, you know, most of us had been recently affected by another virus in some way change the outbreak? And, you know, I don't, I truly think we don't know. Okay. What should dermatologists, what, what is your advice for dermatologists regarding uh, the new outbreak? I would say most important is keep MPOX on your differential. And what I mean by that is that MPOX is with us. And guess what? It is here to stay. So countries that did not previously have MPOX, I don't think we're getting rid of it. I think that we are past the big spike in the outbreak curve that we saw in 2022. And, and thank you so much to everyone who participated in vaccination efforts, which I think were critical um, to control it. But unfortunately, it's here and it's, I don't think it's really going away. So I just, my message to dermatologists is remember that it's there. Um, we're still hearing now, you know, I talked to someone today who said I diagnosed a case yesterday. So it is around. Um, so I think realizing that even a couple of lesions, you know, have, as I say, and this is a very Americanism, have your spidey sense tingling you know, just be, be aware <laughs> that it's there. And as we also say in dermatology, even if you don't see it, it might be seeing you. Oh, is there anything we can do to prevent a new outbreak? Absolutely. Vaccination is key. Um, and so I think there have been a lot of great grassroots efforts. Um, in the U.S., I will say grassroots even more than government <laughs> was effective. So there you go. Um, in terms of spreading vaccine campaigns, um, and I think really getting vaccination for the high-risk groups has been critical. And we're so lucky that we have a good vaccine. Um, what I do want to point out is that not everybody in the world has access to the vaccine. And I think one of the real public health failings for us Worldwide is that most of the countries that previously had MPOX that were endemic, so for example, Nigeria, has zero MPOX of the new MPOX vaccine, zero. 
So the country that had the most cases before the 2022 outbreak has no access to the current MPOX vaccine. Which is really, really sad. Yeah, and a total public health failing. And so yeah. if we want to you know, continue control, I think we just have to consider, you know, worldwide vaccine strategy is so important. Yeah. Just one more question about the high risk, uh, the, the groups at high risk. What are high risk uh, people in this, uh, in this respect? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, two different things. Mm -hmm. One in terms of high risk for outcome, in terms of a poor outcome, um, is that our patients living with HIV who are immunosuppressed are much higher risk, um, probably both for getting it and also for higher risk of mortality, higher risk of death. So if you do have a patient who has HIV, who has MPOX, the most important thing is to diagnose them quickly and to get them on treatment. Um, so tecovirumat, uh, which is the treatment that we use for MPOX, is really particularly essential for our patients living with HIV. In terms of your other question of who's high risk of getting MPOX, um, what we see is that new sexual partners, um, increased number of sexual partners, um, and certainly we've had a concentrated epidemic in men who have sex with men. So those are some of our higher risk um, individuals, but MPOX can truly affect anyone. All right. But I will end on a positive note, which is I think importantly, MPOX diagnostics are more available because it uses PCR, which is the same thing we use for COVID. Boy, we got a lot of PCR around right now. Oh, yeah. Number two, we have a treatment, tecovirumat, which does help. And number three, we're very lucky to be living at a time when a new good vaccine was recently approved prior to the MPOX outbreak. So I do think there's a lot of positives, uh, even if we're living in, you know, a little bit of a, a time of, of scariness in terms of increasing outbreaks. Indeed. Wow. What is the percentage of um, uh, morbidity uh, if you have MPOX? So in the current outbreak, um, it was less than 1%, unless you have HIV, HIV. in which case it's different. Um, but if you compare that to prior outbreaks, um, the CLEAD 1A, which was uh, prior out outbreak mortality was as high as 10%. CLEAD uh, 2A uh, mortality was around 3 to 4%. And then CLEAD 2B, now we're at less than 1%. Okay, well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for listening. And please make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Spotify, or otherwise you can find us on any major podcast provider. We appreciate you joining us and look forward to presenting more interviews, research and other important topics. Stay tuned for the next episode of the Venerology Talk series, which goes live on the 12th of March, covering the topic of HPV vaccines. Until the next episode, take care of your skin and sexual health.